Physics and understanding in the clinical and other scientific communities about how transmission uh, truly occurs and that there's such a multidisciplinary aspect to understanding that. Uh, Lydia is the distinguished professor at Queensland University of Technology and there she serves as the director of the International Laboratory for Air Quality and Health. She is known for her fundamental and applied research in the interdisciplinary field of air quality and its impact on human health and the environment. She has a specific focus on the science of airborne particulate matter. She's a physicist by training and received her doctorate at Jagiellonian, close enough, <laughs> University in Poland for her research on radon and its progeny. She also serves as an adjunct professor at the Institute for Environmental and Climate Research at Xinyang University in China and is advanced chancellor fellow at the Global Center for Clean Air Research at the University of Surrey in the UK. She has authored close to a thousand journal papers, book chapters, and refereed conference papers, and has served at the executive level for several national and international professional organizations. She's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and has received multiple awards, including the L'Oreal UNESCO Award for, in 2023 for Women in Science. And she was named one of Time 100's world's most influential people in 2021 for her global leadership on the importance of airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2. And she also was last year's recipient of the Susan Herring Award for contributions to the scientific knowledge of human health and the impacts of aerosols on human health. Thank you. Lydia, please come up. Good morning, everyone and many, many thanks for inviting me to give this presentation. But more, many thanks for keeping me feel always part of this community, even so it's been very rarely that I was able to come here. Unfortunately, these distances around the world are quite long. So thank you very much. And it was particularly hard last year when I received the award and I couldn't come here and I had to thank for the award. Uh, via a video pre-recorded message. So thank you this time in person. The, uh, Andy and the committee asked me to talk about this uh, topic, the role of aerosol science in understanding and minimizing the risk of airborne infection transmission. One of the topics uh, on which I worked for a long time, but with an increased intensity for the last three years. So I structured my presentation around uh, several points. Past pandemics, what, what have we learned? Generation of particles during respiratory activities, particle detection, characteristics and fate of particles in the air, the fate of pathogens in the air, and the future, healthy indoor air. Now, beyond this, um, I really like to come to two points. Uh, how complete is the science? And do we know enough to act and use this science? So really, I'm painting a big picture, and I'm not going to into much detail in any of this, but I just want you to, to see this big picture. Uh, one more point. I'm more than happy for you to take photos from any slides which you want to remember or use for any good purpose. The past pandemics, what have we learned? Well. Clearly, we've progressed quite significantly from the time when doctors in the past, and this is 17th, the 17th century, were dressed like this. Their masks were a bit different to our masks, and the reason for this was because it was believed then that odor is the reason for infection transmission. Now, in this beak of these masks, there were some leaves of something which smelled nice, which means killing the bad odor. Sometimes they even burn these leaves, so it's even more effective in killing the, uh, well, the, uh, whatever causes the transmission. Well, fast forward uh, to more recent time, to not maybe quite our living memory in terms of Spanish flu, but certainly SARS-1. Uh, SARS so what have we learned? What lessons have we learned? For me, this journey started in March 2023, 20, uh, 
when I was invited by the WHO to help solve the mystery of the uh, spread of the outbreak in the Amoy Gardens complex in Hong Kong. There was a group of um, epidemiologists who was trying to find out the reasons why 300 people were infected from one person who spent one night there. They couldn't, so I was invited. Um, uh, well, I was invited and a group of our, uh, other aerosol scientists. Lucky to me, this um, trip didn't take uh, place because I was horrified with the idea. By that stage, the outbreak was over, so there were no evidence on the ground. But I started looking into this, okay, uh, but by the way, the reason for this was airborne transmission, but very different from the malfunctioning toilet system. So I started looking, what, what do we know? What's, uh, what's this? Until that point, I worked with much smaller uh, particles, ultrafine particles. So I searched um, literature. And the first what I found was this a paper by Digo in 1945 stating the mechanism of airborne infection are not yet fully understood, nor uh, not the extent known to which infection normally takes place. All right, well, fair enough, it was uh, quite a long time ago. But then there was this paper by Mark Mandel, well, <laughs> our recent times, still the relative importance of possible transmission mechanism for many common respiratory in illnesses and so on, remains unresolved. So I thought, how come? Uh, such an important area and we know so little. When I already started working on this um, topic, um, something which was concluded uh, in a paper with my colleague uh, Clive Beggs, who, uh, and we stated one of the main reasons why uh, noscomial infections is such a major problem, is widespread failure to recognize the transmission of infection in, in hospitals, in the complex systems. Now, from what I know and understand now, it's not just it's a complex system, it is an interdisciplinary system, and that's where always the difficulty is. Once we have to bring several disciplines, this is then very difficult. Well, I thought it's then, it's worth devoting time and effort. Uh, I applied for grants and our team started working on this topic. This was my very first paper. Uh, titled Droplet Fate in Indoor Environment, or Can We Prevent the Spread of Infection? And sure, I was not the only one working on this a paper by uh, my colleagues uh, on the role of ventilation in airborne transmission of infectious agents. And there were many, many more papers and work done, well, uh, uh, accelerating after uh, 2003. So, um, the scientific understanding of the role and mechanisms of the transmission certainly advanced before this pandemic. Well, that's all right. The, uh, our scientific knowledge advanced, but did, uh, was that knowledge applied in any way? Our next step was uh, to apply this knowledge to building systems to lower the infection transmission. So we started applying for grants to do just that. Uh, unfortunately, this was not possible because of rejections, and that was one of key ones, uh, with a statement of a reviewer, airborne infection transmission is not possible. But if it's not possible, what's the point of giving money to investigate anything to do with this? Uh, I also found some other strange statements, like this one on the uh, CDC page. Airborne transmission over longer distances, such as from one patient room to another, has not been documented and is thought not to occur. Now, it was then, I checked it two days ago, it is still there. I check it every time whether it's there. So, well, that's the stage, state of knowledge. What I didn't realize at the time, well, with this reviewer, where well, reviewers say all kinds of silly things, so. Um, <laughs> So I didn't realize that this is a much, much bigger issue, not just one odd reviewer or on one strange statement on a website. There was this old dogmas. And the old dogmas are summarized in our paper led uh, by Jose Jimenez, who is here in the room, uh, which very nicely presented what was happening over time in terms of understanding from that miasma theory and paradigm shift and, and so on. I'm not going to, to talk about this, but this was to me an eye-opener. Wow, there's so much to this and the problems is so big. 
old dogmas, but on the top of this, there's also current politics and all kinds of other issues mixed up in this. Well, then there was March uh, 2020, and this statement at the end of March uh, by the uh, um, tweet by the Director General of the WHO, COVID is not airborne. And another one about no need to wear masks. Well, when I saw this, um, it was then something, well, that's it. It really, that's it. This is not an academic discussion. It's not a discussion like often we have with local politicians or whatever politicians about uh, emission source here and there. This has an impact. And seeing these huge signs over the roads then uh, at this time, wash hands, save lives. This is not going to save lives from this virus. So what happened then um, were the most um, intense three months uh, in my life, culminating in this paper open letter, it is time to address airborne transmission of coronavirus. Uh, the paper was by the group of 36, that's how we uh, called ourselves, and two members of the group, Jose Jimenez and Don Milton, are here, but it was then signed by 239 uh, scientists. Now, <coughs> this made uh, an impact. This made an impact the day, next day after the paper was published. The WHO acknowledged evidence emerging of airborne spread. Well, evidence emerging. The evidence was there. That's why we were able to take such a strong stand. If, if we didn't have evidence, we, we wouldn't have done this. Uh, this year, the beginning of this year, we published a paper where we made all the correspondence with the WHO uh, available, and the title of the, pa the paper was uh, COVID-19, uh, science, re science Rejected, Lives Lost, Can the Society Do Better? Well, the society can only do better if we start thinking differently. I like this quote by Einstein, the world, the world as we have created it is a um, process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing the thinking. We need to change thinking very fundamentally. Well, so I will now move to the topic of the presentation, uh, the, the next point, but starting with this changing of thinking, which may sound kind of trivial, changing of terminology. Well, what's terminology? What's the big deal about terminology? So is, is it in the air aerosol or droplet? Well, since I've learned um, the fundamentals of aerosol science, uh, this definition, aerosol, is assembly of liquid or solid particles suspended in a gaseous medium long enough to en enable observation and measurement. Droplet is a liquid, aero a liquid particle. So that's what it was. But then, at the beginning of the pandemic, I found out that in medical sciences, the definitions are completely different. Aerosols are smaller particles, droplet larger particles, with five micrometer, this, the, the boundary between them. And so science had this discontinuity at five micrometer, completely different things happened below and above. And, well, people would kill each other about these definitions. So I realized that there's no way even trying to explain this, and what I then thought and started uh, in particular with, with the communication with the WHO, say, let's don't worry about this, call it the way you want, but I will call it particles, and let's call them particles, is that this is correct from both. And I think this is now kind of uh, accepted, these are particles. So I'll be using the term, and I'm using the term particles. So generation of particles during respiratory activities. This um, diagram from our review uh, in um, nature, science, nature Physics Review sort of shows the complexity of this in a schematical way. So these are the different sites, and in different sites, this bre breakage or burst of fluid, film, filament, or bubble happens in a different way. So in the mouth during uh, speaking, uh, in uh, the vocal cords uh, during uh, when, when, when we speak. Now then there's turbulent um, aerosolation uh, when we are looking in larynx, 
and then in the, the lowest part, in bronchioli, is the, the uh, closing and opening of the passage and then this pop of the particles. Now, if there is a pathogen or a virus uh, anywhere there, this virus, what's going to happen to it, it will possibly be also embedded in, in this particle. Now, this, this was a review. This is not adding, uh, generating new knowledge. It is review. That's what happened a lot during the pandemic. There was consolidator, a consolidation of knowledge, not necessary in relation to a um, mechanism like this generating new knowledge. But how do we know what happens in the respiratory tract? Well, the only what we can do is to model and simulate. We cannot measure any say, anything inside the respiratory tract. I'm reading all this kind of exciting, almost science fiction um, publications about something so nano, which can be sent to different parts of the body for all kinds of purposes. So maybe in the future there will be these nanobots which could be sent there and measure field or something, but for the time being, we only see after the, parti what the particles after they are emitted, and that's how it is. So detection of, part uh, of particles. There are many, many, many different ways of doing this. Now, when we first started thinking about this, how to do it, I spent a lot of time talking to colleagues who were doing something like this in Hong Kong, in Singapore, what's the best way of doing this? And this is uh, what we came up with, is a tunnel, uh, air uh, filtered, uh, laminar air flowing slowly from behind, particles are emitted, and then along the length of this tunnel are different instruments measuring the particles. So. Um, this allowed us to have a very controlled situation in terms of w what was exactly the age of the particle and, uh, and other parameters, but there was a price for this. The price for this was that we were not able to use um, uh, um, the SMPS because the concentrations, was too, concentrations of particles were too small for the SMPS. Well, there's a price for everything in life. Well, a different method was used by uh, Zayas and colleagues, this uh, on the open bench, uh, and here the instrument was very different, laser diffraction system, which uh, they used. And they were able to go to, of course, much, much smaller particles than we were able to do in much larger range every uh, sort of uh, fraction of a millisecond. Now, during somewhat similar system, but with different purpose, uh, was used during, during the pandemic. Uh, now, my colleague Jonathan just left, as I understand, he's uh, here. Um, and the purpose of this was to measure the impact of vocalization, uh, the, uh, of, of the um, uh, speech um, vocalization on the emissions. Well, there's yet another system um, which we designed as a result of not being able to measure everything we wanted with the tunnel, and is this rotating drum, which was discussed extensively yesterday um, at one of the sessions. Um, so here, the, we were able, in this drum, rotating, uh, achieve higher concentrations of particles to test how long pathogens are stable infectious, which now I understand that in relation to virus, it may not be the best idea unless we measure other parameters. But probably for bacteria, it was uh, sort of less problematic. But of course, it's not suitable for um, fast changing processes. Well, so what's the take out of this? There was a lot of call during, uh, during the pandemic for standardization of monitoring techniques. And this was particularly about by those uh, co uh, colleagues from medical uh, community reviewing this kind of papers and trying to make sense of this for the purpose of uh, exposure response. So, well, why don't you guys get your act together, standardize this, so we will be able to properly use it. The problem, of course, is that this is not really possible because there are many, many different aims of studies investigating particles in res from respiratory activities. So the monitoring technique must be appropriate to the aim, and there's no one size fits all. There's no one magic method, one magic instrument which would enable us to measure everything. But one critical aspect is, 
is to, well, first of, of all, making absolutely sure that the, there's the right methods for the purpose, but also to record all the full details of measurement design. We were not able to compare many papers because the details were not included. All right, so that's the measurement technique. So what do we know using this and, and other techniques, which I'm, uh, some I mentioned later, what have we learned? So this is one uh, of the first diagrams of one of our first papers, number size distribution during speech and breathing. So first of all, you can see that this double logarithmic scale, which means there's a very, very big spread in both directions, the size and the concentrations. The most important factor of this, however, is that the majority of the particles are small, so kind of below 10 micrometers, and the significance of this is that they, these particles stay in the air suspended um, longer. You can also see that there are three modes identified there. The first one, the smallest one, Bronhaler fluid film burst, and it is said that that was the site of location of H591. The middle mode is uh, laryngeal vibration, and the uh, largest mode, uh, oral speech articulation, and that is said to be the origin of um, um, H1N1. Now, this is a nice and smooth graph, but to get to this point and using data from many instruments and many methods, this required 10 data processing steps. Uh, also, the scale here, just making sure that you uh, well, you probably see this, that this is a um, particle number concentration. There are diagrams who show this uh, with um, particle mass concentration. I was going to show one of the diagrams which I often shown by uh, Joshua Santarpia, but probably I won't have time for this, which is mass concentration. So, if we now look what other methods um, uh, came up with, so this is the Zayas paper, that's what um, they found out. So as you can see, the majority of particles are well below one uh, kind of half of a micrometer. So the picture is completely different than ours, but you also see that the concentrations are much higher. It's not that they were not larger particles, but in this scale you cannot see them. So it's not that one is wrong and runs right, it's just a different method used. Now, when we talk about concentration and emission rates, Again, this is what uh, came uh, from, 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 from our study, showing that uh, different uh, respiratory activities, breathing, speaking, that all, they all um, um, re um, result in particle formation, but uh, vocalization, like that thing, it was not really singing, it was that ah, uh, the highest. We didn't think how important singing was. Um, very similar results uh, were obtained by uh, Asadi and colleagues uh, about 10 years later uh, using the same instrument because this, this was um, uh, APS and also the relative importance of different activities. Well, uh, I think next time when you are at the birthday party, you think twice about how loud you, you um, uh, sing. What came up from the Bristol study um, here is um, this that happy birthday results in the highest emissions. I think it's two orders of magnitude higher than breathing. So there were this kind of voices during the pandemic that we should quiet the society. Speak, speak not softer. I don't think that that's the way to go. But we understand these things, but there was something really puzzling uh, for me. I was invited to join this study led by uh, David Edwards about airway hygiene. Now, what's airway hygiene? I first didn't know when uh, David talked to me about this. This is basically applying um, a, a sal a saline solution. Something like, I don't know whether you use it. I use it um, uh, on the plains to Australia, 13 hours. You have so dry nose that putting this few drops ever so often really helps. So that, that, that's what it is. So I would have expected that uh, putting this liquid into, into the nose would result with more emissions, but to the contrary, what the study found is that respiratory droplets are decreased in number uh, by up to 99% of applying this. Why? Uh, I, unfortunately, I was not part of the initial study design, so is it because lung surface characteristics changes, flow pattern, something else? Well, there's lots to learn in this. 
All right, so we now know what are, what are the characteristics of particles when they are emitted, um, the dynamics in the air. What happens to the particles emitted uh, into the air? I very much like, uh, like this uh, review. Um, I think this is um, the um, uh, Danish uh, group doing this. I like this because it speaks to me to, as a physicist. All these forces in the right direction, physics of this is very clear, there is no doubt. And again, this is a consolidation of, uh, of science. So let's talk a little bit about some of these processes and in particular evaporation. When I first looked uh, into this topic, I, re I realized that evaporation will be an important uh, um, aspect because, of course, respiratory liquids, uh, respiratory particles are water-based. So this was a kind of easy calculations I did to see the um, particle uh, decrease with time as a result of evap uh, evaporation uh, of particles 1, 10, and 100 micrometers. And when those colorful lines uh, end, means that that's when particle evaporated and evaporate, and you can see this is a small fraction of a second. Those lines which continue longer were particles with sodium uh, chloride so, uh, solution similar to what's in the uh, saliva. So uh, basically the point is that they evaporate very, very fast, basically for any practical reason uh, uh, imme immediately. But that's where the simplicity of physics finishes. And now we are facing the real respiratory fluids, which part of water and salts have all kinds of other things. And if you try to calculate this drying time and other processes, it's much, much dif more difficult than just water and uh, salt solution. But still, they evaporate very fast. And it's been shown that roughly to 20, of, uh, 20 to 40% of the initial size. So basically, what we measure, it's already what's called a droplet nuclei. Some say dry droplet nuclei. It's not dry, but it's a droplet nuclei. So well, if you measure just even at this distance from the mouse, it's probably already uh, evaporated. So significance of evaporation on particle dynamics and inhalation, particle size decreases, smaller particles stay suspended in the air longer and are inhaled in the, the deeper parts of the respiratory tract. So what happens to them then? It is so basic that it's really no point about the, talking about this. Uh, well, some were saying the particles drop like this. What's happening in reality, the particles do this, what that particle did. Basically, they float in the air. And this was, this is a calculation by, uh, done by Wells in this, in his kind of fundamental paper on this where he put all the physical processes, that falling time um, from the height of one millimeter, millimeter. So if you see for the particles of our interest, 10 uh, micrometer one, like one 30,000 seconds. So this particle is not falling, it is staying in the air. Staying in the air and floating like this. So going up with the cloud emitted from the mouse. Now this paper is, um, uh, the first author is the other Lydia, Lydia with Y. <laughs> we call each other like <laughs> this. Um, so he, it is a, well, well, simple flow dynamics, if I can call it this way. One important aspect is we normally talk, uh, when we do any calculations, we do calculations on single particles. But the particles are not single, they are in a cloud, particular in this initial moments of the, uh, of the movement, they are in a cloud. And that cloud dynamics a bit, uh, dif uh, different to single particles than that's what Lydia and her group are doing. So state of uh, knowledge particles, um, the majority of particles are smaller than one micrometer, uh, vast smaller than 10 micrometer. Such particles can stay suspended longer, uh, long in the air and travel long distances, minutes, uh, minutes, hours, travel meters, tens of meters in indoor environment and ro all respiratory activities uh, contribute to this. Now, this, is so, this was so basic, but seeing that this basic science is not, well, no one pays much attention to this. In a frustration when I was writing, it was last year or year before, um, an article for um, the conversation, I, this, this was what's included um, as, an, as a, uh, you can click on the article. Now, 
imagine, you, you don't think about what's in the air, but imagine that what I'm emitting is pink. So you see this pink cloud moving around, you see it. And in this pink cloud, you see these green beads. These are viruses, and this pink cloud is reaching you, and you inhale these viruses. So I was trying to use this pictorial, I don't know to what extent this was um, making an impact, but this brings us now to the topic of the fate of pathogens uh, in respiratory particles. We asked ourselves this question a long time ago, how far infectious aerosols travel, and that's the tunnel I showed you. But the question uh, we were able to address was only in relation to bacteria, pseudomonas, which is a very big threat for uh, cystic fibrosis uh, um, people. Uh, anything to do with viruses was always much more difficult. So clinical dogma and arm's length, that, that one meter. Uh, and we said, we showed it's wrong. The uh, particles, they travel, still infectious, happily, the whole length of the tunnel, four meters. How long uh, aerosols remain infectious in the air? Clinical dogma, seconds, wrong. The um, bacteria was very happily alive, alive still 45 minutes. That was the duration of the, of the experiment. So fast forward to the studies during the pandemic. Vi virus and this virus in the particles. It was interesting to see that many of my colleagues, atmospheric scientists, considered that what's in the air is a naked virus, uh, just the virus. Well, the virus um, is never naked. It's always in that particle containing, well, in the first instance, water, but also all these other <coughs> components. So it is always bigger. How much bigger? Well, many studies, and in particular one of the first studies which demonstrated this was a study by uh, Joshua Santarpia uh, in the, uh, that was in a um, um, hospital environment, showing that particles um, smaller than one micrometer contain higher loads. Not individual particles, but as a body of the particles and the concentration of the particles is higher. We show it some, uh, something similar but in a different way in a study in China. Well, this brings, brings us to all kinds of other, like of a uh, big problematic area. The role of relative humidity. I had my view on this based on what I learned some time ago. Um, and this, that view, well, you depend whether you're talking about envelope viruses or non-envelope viruses, like you can see envelope without explaining what it is. So, um, what is showing here, it's not a response to the role of humidity, but this, is, this diagram is a, uh, from our study, review study, uh, which is under, uh, uh, review study, which is under review in a journal. And uh, it has different colors here. So first of all, the, the effect increases, uh, relative increase with the predictor variable increase, so increase of humidity and temperature. So we have temperature, uh, protein, and relative humidity, the, the bars. And the color represents the relative number of studies. So I'm not showing here what is the role, but what the studies were saying. So in particular, uh, if we look at this one envelope, there are 12 studies showing negative impact, but this number of studies showing positive impact, and this number of studies, no impact. So what's the take? Is there an impact or is not an impact? I'm not, there to, I'm, I'm not daring even to say what my view on this would be because no one really has uh, an understanding of this yet. So um, the role of uh, relative humidity, it depends. Uh, it depends on many factors and who you ask. But really, being very pragmatic, and regardless of this fascinating science, we eventually will get to the bottom of this for every single pathogen, Human comfort range is 40 to 60 percent relative humidity. There are very good reasons to stay within this range. We don't want the drying of our airways, and we don't want hum humidify our environments for, well, doing something to the virus because this will bring other problems. So we have to stay within this range. But of course, it would be good to understand what's happening. Other uh, issues are 
uh, the role of epifluorescence, which is a rapid loss of water, opposite to the liquescence rapid gain of water. Now, this is a very busy diagram from uh, one of um, papers from our uh, research group. Now, don't uh, pay too much attention to anything. I just wanted to sort of, this is the liquescent, this rapid gain, and this is a fluorescence uh, rapid loss. Don't look at the numbers because it was related to the, um, the design of the study. But basically, the conclusion from this was that aerosol becomes a fluorescence when uh, encounter the dry air in, uh, in the room. So the thinking now is, and I say the thinking it's now is that upon efflorescence significant uh, and immediate loss of virus infectivity, and this doesn't seem to depend on the type of virus nor on the temperature. After this happens, the virus decay is much slower, so it stays in the air, it's much slower. Now there are other aspects, and the other aspects are the role of aerosol microenvironment, so that's within the particles. This was a very elegant study conducted by the Bristol group where they levitated the particles and then measured the amount of virus present. I think it was, um, Alan presented this graph yesterday in one of the sessions. But I particularly like uh, this um, uh, picture showing what happens. So in the initial part, you just see the liquid, but gradually you see these crystals. This is crystallization of the salts which are in the, in the particle. Now this creates a very different microenvironment for the virus, and the virus seem to like this microenvironment. Now then there's another one, another uh, issue which is coming, and that's quite recently also discussed by um, Alan yesterday, the role of air composition, and particularly uh, the presence of in influence of um, acidic vapors, and in particular, and also CO2, uh, particular CO2 in the air. So I won't talk much about this, as I said, it was presented yesterday. So that was from the published paper showing the pH in relation, and then in relation to this, to the study design, so 50 ppb of uh, H and of three room air, clean air, and um, infectivity. So you can see that it stays much higher in this more acidic environment. Now, this is now shown in a, a paper by the same group, which is on a, a preprint. And if you look at these dots, so it is now uh, infectivity as a function of CO2 concentration in the air. So if you look at this two, so this is below uh, 500 ppb, but then rapidly in the area, like in this room we have somewhere here, it starts increasing. So it's quite significant uh, increase. So basically cleaning acidic components from indoor air well, would be good uh, for us, not good for the pathogen. How to clean this acidic component? Well, the best way is to get rid of CO2. So that's, this CO2 seems to be a magic parameter for, for everything, one other reasons to keep it low. So state of the knowledge, virus laden particles, um, overall smaller particles contain higher loads of this virus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, but not only others as well. I'm not sure how far it extends. Smaller particles from deeper parts of the respiratory tract, uh, to the contrary, larger particles, uh, less virus from the mouth, and breathing can speak in the main sources. And the significant, uh, significance of the indoor environment and impact of um, pathogen stability. Now, so, okay, we start see, understanding the mechanism, even so there's still a lot to learn. So if we were, let's say, tasked with uh, quantifying risk of infection here in this room from the people here, would we be able to do this? Well, there are huge, huge variations in the characteristics of infectious particles between person to person, between different respiratory activities, with temporal physiological changes, and we've seen, we've measured the same papers, paper in a, a person in the morning and afternoon was different, between different pathogens, under different indoor environmental conditions. How we can generalize this for the purpose of infection control? So, this is something where we need to look for kind of 
approaches, pragmatic approaches that we know, we know lots. We know, we don't know everything, but the question is how to use and how to generalize. Now, I've talked here only about this aspect, which is a particle um, generation, so it's going this way. But there's the important process, um, which is particle inhalation, inhalation with everything which the particle carries, um, which uh, we briefly reviewed in this paper. Now, we know a little bit more about particle inhalation and, 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 uh, uh, and what then exhaled, because we can measure input and output. We measure what's characterized air, which is inhaled and what's exhaled. So between these two, we can actually infer quite a lot. But with particle generation, we have only the output. We don't have the input. So that's why it's much more difficult. So the future, healthy indoor air. And I'm not talking now about only infection transmission because it is only one of the issues in indoor air where we spend basically most of our lives. In our paper two years ago, we um, uh, argued for a paradigm shift uh, to combat indoor respiratory infections and in particular the need for better building ventilation system. So that's in the title, Building Ventilation System. But something else, which was also in this paper, that it is not on the only risk. All the risks in indoor environment must be taken into account, considered. Otherwise, we may solve one problem, but create another problem. So with ventilation, well, this is very basic. If we remove the pathogens from the air by ventilation, of course, the infection risk would go down. But there was all the time during the pandemic, it is this demonstrate, this show this, uh, which is not very easy. In this study conducted uh, in the Marche region of uh, Italy, led by Giorgio Buonanno, what we can see here, the study conducted uh, between um, September um, 2021 until January 2022, on the vertical axis, the number, relative number of cases, and the upper case, upper curve, is the number of cases in this whole Marche region. Now, the point was so the focus on schools, and the, the schools until that, uh, that point were um, naturally ventilated. But uh, Georgia and the team managed to convince the local government to uh, equip 316 schools with mechanical ventilation. So the two lower curves are the number of cases in uh, mechanically ventilated and uh, uh, the lower and uh, oldest um, um, schools without mechanical ventilation, which, of course, there were fewer of these schools. So really the most important is the, this, uh, the bars. And here it is um, um, in proportion to 1,000 students. So you can see, it's probably not very well visible, but you can see this uh, open bars are lower than upper bars. So this shows, and considering it's logarithmic scale, it shows that ventilation as we expected had a positive impact on lowering the infection. But ventilation is, an, uh, is one aspect and uh, infection transmission is uh, only one problem. So here we have, we listed them all. So there is the uh, mitigation of infection, as, as I've discussed. Here is what's coming from outside, particularly um, wildfires. What's generated inside from all kinds of other sources, dampness and mold, which, for which we can provide good conditions, particularly if we increase humidity and uh, at the top of this uh, thermal comfort. So really, we cannot just fix a problem by putting an air purifier. We need to start and rethink building design, heating, ventilation, and air condition design, building operation, and taking e energy uh, into account. So this is basically my focus now working with colleagues. But one critical aspect of this are air quality standards. Well, we have standards for outdoor air, we have emission standards in all the developed countries, emission standards, and we could say we have emission standards, uh, standards, everything complies in theory with emission standards, why do we need to measure air quality? Uh, well, but we also do measure, we have air quality standards. But for indoor air, 
we have only national construction or building codes, however it's, it's called, but do we measure anything? Do we have any other type of standards? There's no performance standards, no measurements whatsoever. In a paper which we published with colleagues last year in the Medical Journal of Australia, titled Health, Health Indoor Air is Our Fundamental Need, the time to act is now. Well, it may sound like cold arms, but really it was a blueprint for indoor air regulatory framework, still with the focus of infection transmission. And in this paper, uh, well, we explained why. That's what we argued should be the numerical values and what pollutants. In the first instance, CO2, uh, 800 best practice, uh, eight, um, um, sorry, 600 uh, and below best practice, 800 uh, above action levels. In this room, we are in below 800. In all the small rooms, we are above 1,000. Uh, ventilation uh, rate after the WHO uh, recommendations, we then uh, suggested uh, 10 liters per second per person. But since then, we've published this Lancet Commission study where we reviewed evidence and it was quite clear that it should be higher, 14 liters per second per person. So that's what we uh, now uh, suggest. Uh, we have now another paper which extends this under review, so I can't really talk about this, adding two other parameters to this PM2.5 and CO. Hopefully by the time next year we can talk about this. But one key element here is if indoor air standards were to be implemented, what do we need to do or what do we need to have? Means or measure. Otherwise, there's no point doing this. So monitoring a key element of enforcement, that was a paper which we published with, uh, led by Prashant Kumar from, Sar from the University of Surrey, real-time sensors for indoor air monitoring. Our conclusion then was that, um, that awareness of indoor air quality risks um, and uh, appropriate regulations are lagging behind, behind the technologies. Since then, the technologies advanced significantly, like, for example, this our low-cost um, koala monitoring, including um, PM2.5 and CO uh, instrument. So there have been a number of papers presented during this uh, conference about uh, purple air monitors using wild scales. It's a different, still different way, a different thing measuring and using them outdoors and calibrating them indoors. So there's still some work needed to develop a pragmatic science-based approach for using uh, low-cost optical sense, PM sensors for indoor air uh, regulatory monitoring. I talked a little bit more about this um, during the conference, European Aerosol Conference in Malaga, but this is really the role of this community. That's what we have to do. So in summary, how complete is the science? Well, we can list all kinds of things which are not complete. So we have qualitative understanding of respiratory particle, um, qualitative understanding of respiratory generation, basic, basic quantitative understanding, um, knowledge of emitted particles and their fate, theoretical understanding of particle deposition during inhalation. Again, this cannot be measured. And many open questions remain. So that's what we argued in our paper and our urgent need to broaden our understanding. Now, isn't this always what academics say? We need more research, we need more research. So yes, sure, we need more research, but what we are saying now, how uh, do we know enough to act? We sure have enough to act. With the knowledge we, we, we already have, we can change the way things are. But for this, we need regulations. And this is really my focus and the focus of many colleagues here, influencing the regulations and providing this blueprint or blueprints for this. As an evidence, so I'm not just saying things which are not right, this is a photo of clean, now it was called clean air forum, not to scare uh, parliamentarians, but it really it meant clean indoor air forum, <coughs> which took place uh, at the end of March uh, in, the Australian Parliament House. So isn't this amazing that conference 
uh, taking place right there. And this work is continued, so, but it takes so much time and so much patience, so much everything to talk to the government's local federal to change things. So with this, um, I'd like to thank all my colleagues around the world. Normally at the end of the presentation you give thank you to your team, to the group of 36, but if I wanted to thank everybody who contributed to this work, we would be here for another hour. And I don't think Andy would agree to this. So I'd like to thank you and thank you all here. All of you who came to me and uh, said that you know about my work, our work, and this is useful. It means a lot to me, and it just gives me these wings and motivation to continue. So thank you very much for this. Thank you for... And you have, if there are any candidates for good postdocs, that's a time to apply. Okay, we do have time for some questions. If anybody wants to come up and ask some questions, Lydia. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, my question is because you mentioned about uh, try to establish the indoor air quality standard. So the only item you mentioned is the carbon dioxide. When you, when we try to set up with like uh, the uh, indoor air quality uh, standards. What other, what other element do you think we should consider, such as PM, ozone, and uh, TVOC, etc.? Well, as I said, this is the topic of our hopefully forthcoming soon paper, but I can say that we are talking about PM2.5 and uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, we could be adding many other parameters. For example, well, there are WHO guidelines uh, which were announced in 2021, which have six parameters. There are also WHO indoor air quality guidelines, which have, which have even more parameters. So we could say we should measure all of them. But this is not realistic. Not realistic because indoor air quality um, for regulatory purposes would have to be uh, conducted differently to outdoor because we cannot have air monitoring station in every room. So. We, can, we must be very pragmatic. We must use the methods which are robust, which we can use, which the, with, from which the data can be interpreted. And that's why those four parameters which we are suggesting. Um, hello, over here. Um, my question is also about the pragmatism of this whole vision. So let's assume that we evolve the technology of low cost sensors enough to put one in each house everywhere. Um, what other structures do we need to make sure that we can sustain that, uh, that vision? In an analogy, for instance, say we have firefighters that come to our house every year or so, check the fire extinguishers. Should we have something like this for the indoor instruments as well? And who is going to be doing that? Well, th this is a critical point, and that's when I said this is the role for this community. That's what we need to work on, because that calibration will have to be done differently. There probably won't be someone coming every year to measure this. We need to find some other ways of calibration. And also there is an issue that uh, local sensors, any optical sensors, respond to different types of particles differently. So if we have the same gravimetric concentration of dust, and the same gravimetric concentration of uh, vehicle emissions, the optical sensor will tell us something different. So we will need to come um, uh, with a way of dealing with particles um, um, relevant to indoor environments and how we can pragmatically say the range of this. But there's one other aspect of this. You mentioned houses. We are not proposing that indoor air quality standards will be imposed in um, private houses. This is not possible. Like cigarette smoking is not banned in private houses. So therefore we are talking about only public spaces. And in the public spaces, particularly with the modern spaces which have building management system, we have other ways of calibrating things. So designing this should be part of this. 
but with the um, with these buildings, what we are looking at the future, we should really also think about the ways of how to design buildings in the future such that we have we don't have these problems. The designs which we have now with mixing ventilation always will and always do create problems. We have to have different designs. And this is not something that's my focus. Of course, we should fix the current problems where we can with the means we have. But in the future, the buildings should be designed differently, such, and in particular, displacement ventilation, such that we don't have these problems. It's not going to happen next year in five years. The, these buildings will still be here for the another 20, 30, 40 years. But I'm looking far into the future than this. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, Andy Alt, University of Michigan. Um, so often during the pandemic, there's been pushback from the medical community who just based on a lack of understanding of aerosols and sort of the fundamental physical science behind it. Would it be found to be the most effective methods for communicating? Because I, mean, I know when I <coughs> excuse me, informally talk to say doctors or things like this, there's often just a total lack of awareness about a lot of the work that you and others have done. How would it be found the best ways to break through? Well, actually, this is a very interesting point. It is that belief is that the whole medical community has, is pushing back and it's not understanding, doesn't want to understand. But it is, this is not my experience. I've, I've worked for a very long time, all this initial study on Pseudomonas and, and so on, I did with medical colleagues, many medical colleagues from different organizations and, and more than not only in Australia, around the world. And there was no one of them who didn't believe, who had any issues with, uh, with this. Now, after, the, after our paper was published, the uh, open letter, I uh, received thousands, tens of thousands of emails from many different um, experts. There was not a single, not a single medical doctor who would say, I don't agree with this. This is true. So this not accepting the science, it's not something within medical communities, respiratory physicians, they can understand what's happening. They are very bright people. It is somehow embedded in the, uh, the decision makers, like WHO, like government. So it's a different world. And again, that's a, a separate study why this world is different. So that's my response. So I guess, do you have any ideas about how we can eventually convince those decision makers um, within the WHO? Um, well, that's what we did at the time of the pandemic. We are working all the time on this. The, 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 what I see, the only way is to gather a sufficiently large body of experts from many disciplines. Because if you go to them, they won't listen. If I go to them, they won't listen. But eventually, if there's sufficiently large body, and sufficiently loudly saying this, hey, listen to us. Like uh, yesterday during the panel, uh, the last panel um, was how to, to work with the influencing the policy. The, uh, one of the panelists says, well, how can we help these decision makers? And then I whispered to somebody sitting uh, next to me, it's not how we can help, help them, how we can force them to listen. Because that's the point, they don't want to listen. And how can we force them to listen? There are many different ways, probably depend on the country, dependent whether you are talking to the state government, to the federal government, but, well, I'm novice in this area as well. Thank you. Hi, this is Joseph Dawson with the RAND Corporation. I also have questions on policy, uh, which would be, it seems that as we get ready to, as a community, start suggesting standards for indoor air, there's an opportunity for us to make mistakes. And how do we as a community avoid making mistakes early and suggesting regulation that don't come back to bite us in the future? The example I'm gonna give is the, the mention of PM earlier. We have PM regulation. Well, not all PM is the same. Even something as simple as liquid versus solid is gonna have major health effects in different ways. So how do we as a community build these regulations going forward rapidly, but also without making crucial mistakes? Well, there are, 
a very important question. There are two, uh, two uh, aspects of this. The first is that we all have to work. It's an interdisciplinary issue, and it cannot be just a group of aerosol scientists or whatever group. We need to have a body of experts from all the relevant disciplines, so it's one point. But uh, for the second point, specifically in relation to particulate matter, which we suggest should be included in the standards, we don't to need to reinvent the world. There are WHO health guidelines. It took us five years, I was a co-chair of this uh, um, update of the guidelines, five years to review all medical evidence relating on the impact on particles PM2.5 and PM2 on health. So, of course, it's not perfect. Of course, we don't still have anything about ultrafine particles, for example, but we have medical evidence already. And that medical evidence clearly shows that regardless of the um, source of the particles, exposure curves are the same, all from all kinds. So we can uh, kind of use this for, for, for this purpose. The, one of the issues there is that um, the standards in particular in relation to PM2.5 has averaging times of one annual and 24 hours. None of this is really relevant to indoor environment, um, well, even 24 hours. But then we can have a different approach. We can take use that value, but apply to shorter averaging times of that kind. But as I said, in terms of epidemiological evidence, we have it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you, Lydia. Let's thank her again, everyone. What a fantastic plenary. Thank you, Lydia. That was, uh, I learned so much and it's really inspiring. Um, I want to invite um, Melissa Galloway and Raghu Betha up. Um, we'll be doing the uh, student awards first. Before we announce the awards, I just want to say thank you to everyone here who helped out with the judging of the awards. Um, we had 136 judges doing 